Liver and spleen. Here we go again. Palpation liver. You can only feel the inferior border of the liver, right? Because the rib cage covers up everything else. Mm -hmm. There are several techniques that you can employ to do this. There's just a, a review of the liver. Remember the gallbladder is almost right in the mid axillary line. If that gets swollen and blown up, uh, that can act as a tender uh, point. Like where I told you my daughter's story when she got the appendicitis. Very, very tender to touch there. But that's the inferior border. Notice it's kind of an oblique angle. It's not perfectly flush with the bottom of the screen. Palpation uh, patient will be supine again with the knees bent, just the same position we've been using. You will be on the right side. You will start by placing your left hand behind their back on the 11th and 12th ribs and then pulling the ribs up. So you effectively be pulling the liver. They say you're pulling the liver forward. You're probably just stabilizing it more than anything else, but gives it some support. Then on your right hand, you're going to sink the fingers into the right uh, upper quadrant, about five centimeters below the costal margin, midclavicular line. Where was, you remember the border? What's a normal border? How, how far are you allowed in the midclavicular line? How far are you, is the liver allowed to be percussible below the costal margin? Three centimeters. Three centimeters is the correct answer. So then you sink your fingers in. I'll demonstrate this in a minute. Go about five centimeters below just to be safe. And then as you start to sink your fingers in, you pull your left hand up. You're kind of sandwiching the liver. And then you do one more thing. You have the patient take a nice breath in, a deep breath in. Why would you do such a thing? Yeah, right Diaphragm goes down as you inspire. It pushes the liver down. Gives you a better chance of driving the liver into your fingers. There is a picture from Seidel of the force in the line. So you're pushing right there. There's your hand uh, pushing up. Patient is breathing in as you do this. Okay, there's also a hooking technique that you can use uh, on people who are obese. It seems to work a little bit better. Let's just jump right to the picture. Uh, you basically hook your fingers in uh, underneath the costal margin and then have the patient take a deep breath in and again, it drives the liver down. Uh, this is usually used really for obese people. It seems to work better. Finger position, normally the fingers are, there's two ways you can go. You can put them just where they're pointed up toward the clavicle. I like to angle them and see the labor books allow you to angle them toward the left shoulder. That way, if everybody puts your fingers straight up, notice how the long finger's sticking toward the ceiling? Now angle them, either one way or the other, and see how you get, you get like three of them more in a flat line so you're not poking the patient with one finger, you're poking them with three. Uh, so that seems to work a little bit, bit better. So I'll show you, I'll demonstrate that. But you can do it either way you want. Okay, we did the hooking technique. Uh, fingers can be either way. What should, what should the liver feel like? If you feel it, remember normally you don't feel the liver unless the patient is really, really thin uh, or unless they have disease. I mean, sometimes you might be able to hallucinate the border in there. Um, I don't think I've been doing this quite a while. I don't think I've really ever felt one in all the students I've done this on. Um, usually it's something wrong with them. Um, but you usually don't feel the liver. Uh, if you do feel the liver, it's supposed to be a soft, kind of squishy feeling. Should not feel rock hard. And the border of it, you can push above and below. You can feel a sharp border uh, going across, uh, so they say. It should not <coughs> feel rock hard. That sharp edge that you can palpate should not be rounded or there should be, it should be not knobby. Those are all signs of bad stuff. Should not feel nobular. That's just like nobby. Uh, and all of these are indica indications of pathology. And again, remember, if you do feel the border, it better be right next to the costal margin. It better not be down than three centimeters. That's like a little bit bigger than a quarter. That's about a 50 cent piece. So it better be pretty close to that. Liver tenderness, ooh, three stars. So that's good questions to ask on your final lab exam. 
Uh, tenderness suggests inflammation, two things. Inflammation, liver's inflamed, or the gallbladder's inflamed, right? It's right there as well. Uh, or venous congestion. So inflammation is usually from hepatitis or cold, what's cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder. Venous congestion, we've talked about that a million times. That's the traffic jam scenario. Coming from pulmonary hypertension, probably secondary to either COPD um, or heart failure. It could be right heart failure, it could be left heart failure. Uh, but the pump's not working, so the, the cars back up, the heart's the traffic jam, cars back up into the jugular vein, back up into the liver. Where else can they back up into? The abdomen, yeah, they can. Ascites, you can get from that. How about the spleen? They can absolutely back up into the spleen and make the spleen start to swell and get big as well. Okay, uh, COPD, heart failure, uh, valvular stenosis can do it. If you have stenosis on the left side of the heart, it's like you can't squeeze blood through the left side of the heart, so the traffic jam starts at, let's say, the aortic valve, and it backs up uh, all the way, it backs up into the left ventricle, into the left atrium, now it backs up into the lungs, now it backs up into the right side of the heart, and now it's off to the races and gets into the liver. So it can come all the way from aortic stenosis. Okay, sun with the liver, the spleen, a very large encapsulated organ, a lot of lymphatic tissue. This is one of your main generals in your army, your white blood cells. Uh, it is a fighter. Can you live without a spleen? You absolutely can live without a spleen, but you might get a little sicker than normal people get sick because you've lost a big part of your immune system. It's in the up, left upper quadrant between the fundus and the diaphragm. It's specifically, it's in a region, I don't think you know this, called Traub <clears throat> space. Do you know that? I think I've mentioned it. But Traub space, it doesn't, be careful though, it doesn't normally live in Traub space. The gastric air bubble lives in Traub space and the, the spleen is behind the gastric air bubble. So it's deep to Traub space. So guess what the percussion note is of Traub space, if the gastric air bubble lives there? Tympanic, great. Better not be dull. Or if you've eaten a huge meal, now you fill up your stomach with food, it's gonna be dull. But uh, The spleen can easily fit into the palm of your hand when it's normal. There's that little guy, remember it in gross anatomy, hiding behind the fundus, a little bit of the greater curvature there it lives. Main function is phagocytosis and immune functions. Huge member of your army. Uh, it also has some lipid amino acid metabolism functions. I wouldn't, probably wouldn't ask you that. But it does produce lymphocytes uh, like crazy immunoglobulins. Uh, the other functions are poorly understood. They still a lot to unravel regarding what the, fu the function of the spleen. Uh, but it's definitely not essential for life. Yeah, let's see. So splenomegaly, the most common problem with the spleen is it swells up and it gets big. That's called splenomegaly. Symptoms may be present. Uh, the patients can will say like when they take a deep breath, it feels like they have sandpaper underneath their ribs, right where the fundus is. Or there's something dragging or moving inside there is what they say. They can get dyspepsia real easy because it pushes into the fu fundus of the stomach. So you just lost some of the capacity to fill your stomach. And let's see, some patients with uh, splenomegaly can have a classic syndrome called hypersplenism that has a classic triad of anemia because the spleen does make white blood cells. Uh, leukopenia, that's leukopenia, uh, and thrombocytopenia. So you're, you lost one of your producers of some of the troops. Splenomegaly, what causes it? A couple stars here, so these are good questions for me. Uh, infection can swell up. This spleen, spleen can get infection with like a subclinical septicemia type thing because a lot of blood vessels go in there as well. Uh, infective endocarditis, mononucleosis, nucle mononucleosis in particular. Any blood like staph aureus in the blood can do that. Uh, we already said con portal, uh, portal hypertension causes congestion. When the spleen fills up with blood, so the liver would fill up with blood first and then the backup continues into the spleen. That's called congestive splenomegalia. 
and it's not from a problem like a cirrhosis of the spleen doesn't happen, but it's it's because of the traffic jam from the spleen. The cause is usually cirrhosis of the liver, uh, or sometimes you can get an embolism stuck in the portal, the portal vein, and it causes a traffic jam, and it can make the spleen blow up really quick like that. Some more causes. It could be cancer, so this is a chance or a case where it, uh, it blows up in size, not because of a problem with the liver, uh, but itself. So Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's and multiple myeloma can definitely call it splenomegaly. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus can do it as well. Storage diseases, Gaucher's uh, can do it. It can blow up the liver. It can also blow up the spleen. Uh, neiman picks disease, mucopolysaccharidosis, those classic glycogen storage diseases, which I know you're so familiar with from your biochemistry days. Amyloidosis can do it. It's kind of like uh, amyloid tissue fills it up. It can happen to the liver, too. It's kind of like st storage, uh, these storage diseases, only these fill up with glycogen. These fill up with amyloid, which is like a weird protein that gets laid down for no reason. Uh, where is the spleen? We said it's behind Traub's space. You definitely 100% need to know these borders because you have a high chance. It's probably a 60% chance you will be asked this. What are the borders of Traub's space? So the superior border, let's go look at a picture of it. Here it is right there. Let's blow it up even more. Superior border is the bottom of the sixth rib. So there's our fifth intercostal space, which we've worked with so much. Uh, this quarter. So it's the bottom. Uh, the middle border, here's the middle axillary line, which we've worked with a lot. Here's the costal margin, which we've worked with a lot. And then the mid axillary line is just that line like where that your shirt material is kind of sewed together, right down there. Some authors say it's the anterior axillary line, uh, but the, our board books use the mid axillary line, so that's what I'll go with. Make sure you know those borders. So the normal percussion note in this region, especially down low, uh, is timpani. It could be resonant as well. Uh, some people don't have a great gastric air bubble. That's okay if it's if it's resonant note, uh, but it better not be rock hard like 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 percussing the desktop. Uh, that's a sign that something's going on in there, and it could be the spleen is filled up uh, with pus infection or blood from a traffic jam scenario. Something's wrong if that happens. And the sensitivity and specificity is not really that bad. It's in the 80%. So this is one, uh, one time where the percussion actually doesn't, it's not the greatest, but it's not as good as ultrasound, but it's not, it's not bad. Okay, everything we kind of said, it normally contains the gastric air bubble, does not contain the spleen. The spleen's behind it normally, uh, and its percussion note is tympanic. It's okay if it percusses resonant, but it should not percuss dull. Okay, so if I ask you to percuss Traub space, the thing we're worried about is the spleen invading it, so all you have to really do is percuss the borders go down the mid-axillary line to make sure it doesn't sound dull as can be. It still should be resonant because your lung tissue's here. Make sure the spleen hasn't invaded it. You can percuss right down the middle of Traub space and you can percuss the medial border of Traub space. Uh, in other words, those are the, the three lines that you want to do. You can percuss the whole thing. You can go back and forth if you want. But I'm particularly interested in this mid-axillary line because when we'll see a picture when the spleen gets large and evades, it usually kind of, take, the dullness starts to come, work its way in from the mid axillary line immediately. So that would be the first, uh, the first indication of it. Okay, I think everything we said there, splenomegaly, if it does percuss as dull, uh, it's splenomegaly, unless the patient had a huge meal and the fundus is packed with food, then it could sound dull as well. <clears throat> Okay, those are just some of the different options. Here's kind of a good, this is a great picture to put in your brains. So here's Traub's space, the guy's laying face up. There's this bottom of the sixth rib. So normally the spleen is way back here just hanging out. Actually, probably should be down here a little bit lower. The fundus is down here. Uh, but 
everybody's a little different probably, but as the spleen starts to fill up with blood, if the patient has cirrhosis of the liver, say, it gets big, it starts to poke right up into the fundus and push everything up. So if you percuss down the mid-axillary line, you'd hear resonant, 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 resonance, and then thud, like a domus. Uh, that would not be the greatest sign in the world, and you heard that. You could still percuss over here, and it would be perfectly normal. So I guess if you had to percuss one spot to check for splenomegaly, go down the mid-axillary line, and it better be, uh, at the worst, it better be resonant. It better not sound like you're palpate or you're percussing over the table. Okay, there's another little, little uh, cartoon of it. Sensitivity and specificity for this is ain't bad, moderately accurate. Uh, so sensitivity is in about 70%. That's not great, but it's not horrible. But the specificity is about 83%. So that's not, I mean, uh, EMG, NCV is getting around that area. So that's not too bad. What, so specificity, what does that mean? So if you're percussing and you hear dullness, is that a specific finding or a sensitive finding? Sensitive. Specific finding. Specific spin uh, goes with positive finding. Okay, make sure, because I've thrown that one out there a little bit. I like that sensitivity and specificity. And there's to refresh specificity. So if you find split, if you find a positive test, specificity. Find a negative test, sensitivity applies. So that one's not the greatest, but specificity is not too bad. Palpate the spleen, you do exactly the same technique. Board books want you to stay on the right side and just kind of reach over. If you want to come over to the left side to make it easier, I don't think there's a problem with that. And there it is again, you push, you pull up with one hand, push down, and as you sink down, have them take a deep breath in to drive the spleen down into the fingers, and you normally shouldn't feel anything. Thank you for listening. I will now demonstrate.